Welcome to Saturday Church. Be well, be safe, and hope to see you soon. We all miss you. We all miss you. Good morning, friends, and welcome to this week's edition of Virtual Worship with Center Church in Meriden. My name is Connor Filkins. I'm the pastor here at Center Church. And on behalf of our entire congregation, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's service of worship. We are an open and affirming church in the UCC, which means that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, your unique life's journey, you are welcome here to press into faith, whatever faith means to you whether you feel a deep connection with the divine or whether you're still searching and still figuring things out, you're welcome to do so here. Before we get started, I just wanna lift up a few reminders. We have our check-in button that we use every week to let us know that you've worshiped with us. Please fill that out and let us know whether you're a longtime member or whether you're just starting with us today. Please fill that out so we can get connected with you. Uh, we have prayer requests also that you can fill out each week. Uh, those get lifted up either in the worship service or you can uh, choose to have them uh, share them privately with me. That's also an option. And we also have announcements at the end of the service. So stay tuned all the way through till the end of the video for those announcements so that you can see what is going on in our community. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. If you would join me now in our call to worship. The people of Israel were called out of Egypt by God, freed for something greater. God brought them out for a purpose. In the same way, God calls to us, guiding us toward something greater. God calls to us for a purpose. Like the Israelites, we are not called into a peaceful world, but a messy one in hopes that we can be the peace and righteousness that is needed. To, to answer, answer God's call, we, we must be what God will be, by being ready to, to be God's hands and feet in the world. Amen. Good morning, friends. When I woke up this morning, I looked into the mirror and I said to myself, man, I am looking rough. I need a haircut. My teeth need cleaning. The bags under my eyes look awful. Did you ever start your day like that? Or have you ever given yourself negative messages like 
I'm stupid or I can't do math or I'm a terrible drawer or I can't sing or I'm just a terrible person. The thing about it is those kind of messages are really powerful. And if we tell ourselves those things enough or if other people say them to us enough, they start to become real. We start to believe them and they're just not true. I know I often describe myself as a saying, I'm very clumsy or I'm terrible at learning names, but it's not the thing to do. See, our Bible story today is from Exodus and Moses is talking to God through a burning bush. And he asks God, who shall I tell them has, has sent me? And God says to Moses, I am. I am who I am. So those I am messages that we give to ourselves should strive to be positive ones. Because remember, we have God in us. And so whenever we give ourselves those negative messages, it's denying a chance for us to do the kind of work in the world that God has sent us here to do. So the messages that we should give to ourselves are much more positive. I am kind, I am strong, I am persistent. So here's my homework for you. I know school hasn't started yet, but this one is an important little piece of homework that won't take you much time at all. I want you in the morning, each day, as you look at yourself in the mirror, from combing your hair, which hopefully you do look in the mirror before you go out the door or before you go online in your distance learning classes. I want you to give yourself three I am messages that are positive. Things like I am kind, I am loving, I am smart, I am persistent, I am hardworking. And I want you to end with a sentence, I am a beloved child of God. Because there's no better thing to be. Be well, my friends, and God bless. Bye-bye. Friends, our scripture lesson this week is coming from the lectionary text from the Old Testament. The book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And it tells a very familiar story to us. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burnt up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a, fl a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, 
If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is God's name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And God said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Friends, I preach again today with a heavy heart. Protests against police brutality have been reinvigorated once again over the shooting of Jacob Blake. Not that the protests that started in June over the murder of George Floyd ever really stopped. The cries of the black community returned to the spotlight of our communal attention span. And once again, we are faced with the question of if and how we will respond. And if you're thinking right now, here we go, another sermon revolving around injustice, I'm right there with you. That was my exact thought as I began writing this week. Here we go again, again and again. It weighs on me so heavily to have to tackle these topics with such frequency. It would be much less taxing for me to ignore it all and offer light, faith-filled, care-filled sermons week in and week out. But the fact of the matter is, even on the weeks where the sermons are light and faith-filled and caring, there are still persistent injustices in the world continuing to burn like the wildfires out west. In the face of seemingly unending hatred, evil, and destruction of life, it is difficult to imagine a world without them. They are so persistent that it almost feels like we can do nothing to eradicate them. That's why it's so easy to shut them out compartmentalize them, and focus on the good in life. Even more so, it is difficult to imagine ourselves effectively participating in goodness, love, and life in a way that actually makes a difference. These moments make us feel small, insignificant, and they further the damage of hate, evil, and destruction by making us believe that we have absolutely nothing to offer or that we can't do what is necessary to bring about change. Now, the Israelite people during their centuries in slavery had this exact mindset drilled into them. In their oppression, they were made to feel small, inferior, insignificant, they were relegated to a life where they felt like they could not make any impact beyond whatever they were ordered to do by the slave masters, by Pharaoh. They could not imagine anything beyond what went on in the world in that moment in their oppressed state. In our passage from Exodus today, God breaks that cycle. In revealing God's self to Moses in the classic scene of the burning bush, God is setting in motion God's intent that worlds where oppression and marginalization persist will be upended. God's intent is revealed starting in verse 7, where God says to Moses, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. Not only is this a moment where God is revealed to Moses, but God is also assuring the reader that the cries of those who are oppressed have been heard. And not only have they been heard, but there is also a plan 
to address the source of their oppression, the source of their anguish, the source of their cries, the Egyptians who subjugate them, their oppressors. In order to set this plan in motion, God calls out to Moses, telling him that he is about to be sent to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites from their oppression. Moses' Moses' response was relatable, to say the least. And as I said earlier, and I and so many others in the world struggle to imagine ourselves doing things that can actually make a difference. Things that could change the world in the way that Moses is about to do. And Moses, like us, is hesitant, not for a lack of wanting to do something, but because he simply couldn't imagine himself doing something that could change the world in such a drastic way. He responds to God out of his hesitancy, saying, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This was an unexpected encounter, to say the least, for Moses. He didn't wake up that day with big plans to free a nation from tyranny and oppression. And the plan and the idea of himself being a leader in it are overwhelming for him. So he naturally questions God about his choice. And God responds not by listing Moses' qualifications, skills, or anything that would lead anyone to believe that Moses could do the job. No resume, no skill sets. Instead, God assures Moses that he is the right choice simply because God is faithful. Moses' lack of qualification does not matter in this case. His sole qualification is God's promise when God says, I will be with you. Confidence isn't found in Moses' achievements or prerequisites but in God alone. Moses continues, though, with his line of questioning, not yet convinced. He asks God for a name that he may give the Israelite people if they ask. It's not clear why Moses felt the need to ask whether there was intent or if he was simply stalling, but God answers, I am who I am. Now, the meaning of this response has long been debated. The translation isn't perfect either. In biblical times, the name of God of Israel was too holy to speak out loud. The Hebrew phrase translated as I am who I am is a difficult one to translate. And while we most commonly read it as translated as I am who I am, there is a sense of causality in the phrase. What I mean by this is that God is not just giving a name, but is also claiming to be the cause, the catalyst of change. There is a sense that in God's name, something is happening too. A translation that captures this sense might be, I am the one who causes things to pass, or I will be what I will be. Essentially, God is claiming to be the catalyst of change, the catalyst of the change that is about to happen in the world, the change that brings about justice and righteousness, the change that will bring Israel out of Egypt. Now, we, we as Christians often use the phrase, quote, moved by the Spirit. When we put into, into words a time where God moved us to action, we use this phrase. The meaning captured in that phrase, I think, is a good parallel to the phrase we, we read as, I am who I am. It's the sense that God inspires within us the actions that ultimately lead to change for the better. So when we mix up the translation and say something like, I will be who I will be, it gives us the sense that God is the cause of what is yet to come. But where is the follow through? Where is the what will be in the I will be what I will be? In this passage, it's Moses. God is catalyzing and inspiring change that will be carried out by Moses. 
The rest of Exodus, all the chapters that follow, is a domino effect that starts with this very moment where God pledges God's presence throughout the things to come to Moses. But it is through Moses that that call, that mission, that liberation is carried out. Now, as people of the God of Jesus, who was one of the God of Moses, that same God calls to us in the same way, seeking to inspire the same courage in us as Moses, as Jesus, and so many others like them. As Christians, we seek the influence of the Holy Spirit to catalyze change through us, both in us and through us. And through her, we can find the same guidance as Moses. Though we may feel unqualified, we are able nonetheless because God is always with us. Because of that, we have every qualification to be who God will be in this world and bring about change for good. And friends, there is no shortage of need and injustice around us. The cries of injustice are voiced every day. The black community cries out over the shooting of yet another one of their own. The earth cries out over its mistreatment. There are so many wrongs waiting to be righted, and there is no shortage of opportunity for Christians to leap into action, whatever that action may look like. There's only one question left, though. Will we answer the call and say, I will be who God will be in this world? Amen. Friends, we arrive now at the portion of our worship service where we lift up our community's joys and concerns. Uh, as always, you can fill out the prayer request button on our virtual worship website if you would like prayers included week in and week out. And this week, Jim Chapman is offering up prayers for his daughter-in-law, Melissa, who continue, continues her battle with scleroderma, a painful degenerative autoimmune disease of the digestive system. She has been for the last two years receiving nourishment through, from a mechanical TPN feeding system and has regained some weight, but still she needs all the help and prayers that we can give. So thank you, Jim, for lifting up Melissa and we are keeping you, Jim, in our prayers as well as you walk through that journey with your family. Barbara Langner is offering up prayers for the family of Fred's donor as the 28th anniversary of Fred's transplant surgery approaches. She asked God's blessing on the donor family, who in the midst of their tragedy and grief get, gave Fred the precious gift of life. And thanks to their loving gift, we all shared in Fred's life for an additional 19 years. And our joy came through that family's sorrow. So we are keeping the f family of Fred's donor in our prayers this week. And as well, we are keeping Barbara in our prayers too. Thank you, Barbara, for lifting that up. I would also like to lift up prayers for a former classmate of mine in high school who is recently very much struggling with mental health issues. So we are keeping her in our prayers this week too. Friends, if you would join me now in prayer. Holy, still speaking God, you are the power of liberation. You called your servant Moses to lead your people through the waters of death and oppression to freedom. You gave Moses the wisdom to proclaim your holy way. We pray for the same guidance and the same wisdom that we might be led to your perfect way of love. Guide us, loving God, in the ways of your righteousness. Help us find ways we can answer your call. Help us discern who we will be through the power of your devotion and the power of your loving justice. Help us be your hands and feet.
in all the things that we do. God, we pray all these things in the name of the one who guides us in these ways, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this week. Before I give the benediction, I just want to lift up a couple of reminders. We have our worship check-in button that you can fill out. Let us know you worshiped with us. We'd love to know who is seeing these worship services and who is getting something out of them. We also have announcements after the benediction, so stay tuned for those. We've got some special announcements this week about some important fall programming that we're going to be announcing in the next week or so. So stay tuned for those. Friends, God gives us life and sustains us. Goodness and righteousness are at the center of all that God is. And God calls us from whatever our situation, whatever our place in life, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey, to embody that goodness and righteousness in all that we do. Through our participation, God continues to be who God will be throughout time. And the question that lies in front of us is this. How will we be who God will be in the times and struggles at hand? In that question, we can find our purpose and our way to bring change and love to a world that sorely needs it. Friends, may God bless you and keep you, and may God's face shine on you and fill you with the warmth of indiscriminate divine love on this day and always. Amen. Thanks, friends. We'll see you next week. Hi, this is the August Mission Moment. This is a container 
It's one of those shipping containers. Breadline Africa collects money from people like us, which we will be doing for August, to give shipping containers for things like classrooms, which this is, or libraries in Africa, so that there is some sort of structure for people to have classrooms and learning in. So if you feel the spirit move you, please send your donation to the missions group, mail it to church, and we will send it at the end of the month to Breadline Africa. Thank you.